See the full screen well? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, thank you um, for joining this education uh, lecture. And I um, apologize again for the technical difficulties so that I had to join a couple minutes late. But this is the um, this is the DNN um, on FPGA lecture, and I'm um, very grateful to have this opportunity to go through these um, DNN FPGA lecture for the next two hours. I would like to have this um, more interactive than just you know one sided. But a quick introduction on myself: um, I'm Jason So. I'm an associate professor at School of ECE at Arizona State University. Um, this is my website that you can find further information about my contact and um, recent research and publications. Okay, so further ado, let's uh, first briefly touch base on the outline. So this is a lecture on DNN IPGA. So first I'm gonna go through um, some DNN algorithm information and basics of it. And then mostly I'm gonna focus on a lot of the different um, you know, information and optimization, design um, techniques on DNN inference on FPGA. And that includes data flow, um, parallelism and memory access optimization, um, some specific case studies on accelerator structure to at least deep uh, dive deep into um, one specific ones and then different ways of, you know, generating these accelerators, especially there are, you know, um, commercial and custom tools that are being really developed a lot and improving, including HLS and some automatic RTL generation. And then further on, um, there are further algorithm advances that have been well integrated onto FPGA, such as low precision, quantization, pruning, sparsity compression. And then um, beyond DNA inference, there also has been several DNA training accelerators. Um, showing some competitive um, performance on GPUs for certain settings. And then finally, I'll summarize my talk. So um, just to um, set the stage, um, this is, you know, I think going through the whole thing for the next uh, one and a half to two hours will be, you know, a little bit too much. And I would like to, you know, put some breaks, maybe, you know, every 30 or 40 minutes or so, and then, I'll kind of pause and uh, hopefully there will be some of the questions. And at that point, I can uh, work with uh, Lee maybe to, you know, at least go through some questions that have been asked uh, during the chat. At the same time, I, it might be a little inefficient to take care of the questions, um, you know, as they come into chat um, in at any moment. So let's uh, let me kind of go through a chunk of the slides and take some questions and uh, both, you know, the, some live questions as well as the questions on the Zoom chat, and then go to the next chunk and so on and so forth. And I believe at the end, there will be definitely some further time for any additional questions. Okay. All right. So first, let's go through the DNN algorithm. So um, as we all know, there has been a lot of success on deep learning, deep neural networks, um, and different forms of artificial intelligence. To name a few, um, DeepMind has developed a number of uh, very new and uh, state-of-the-art algorithm. For example, several years ago, there has been uh, AlphaGo um, winning over Isedo, and then AlphaFold, um, also some you know reinforcement learning-based StarCraft. They are able to be humans. We all have probably, you know, one or several questions, I mean, several um, products in terms of speech recognition where we can ask, you know, any questions and, you know, really converse nowadays with some of these personal assistant devices that all based on speech recognition, deep neural network, whether it's on the edge or the cloud. And nowadays there's definitely, you know, including Tesla, Uber, many, many of the, uh, car companies also uh, a lot of focus development, you know, custom hardware algorithm on autonomous driving, um, computer vision with you know 
know, integration of a lot of different sensors. And for example, another like AlphaGo, I'm sorry, Amazon um, put out these cashless stores, right? So supposedly using some computer vision algorithms and hardware um, that, you know, we don't have to really go through a cashier and do the barcode thing. We just take it and leave it and it's automatically hard. So um, these are just some um, categorizations of different DNN um, algorithms in the literature. So there's very, you know, divergent types, um, different types of uh, deep convolutional network, recurrent network, short, long short term memory, more recently, um, GAN or generative adversarial networks. And, you know, throughout the 30 years, some papers like this nicely kind of, you know, surveyed a lot of different um, algorithms from you know, conventional feed forward, some of the more brain inspired spiking, recurrent, more recently unsupervised and so on. So, you know, just to, you know, get, get down to some of the basics, what is deep learning and what are these deep neural networks doing? Right? So the goal of deep learning is to learn feature hierarchies. And when we have a, for computer vision applications, we have an input image or input video coming in. And then we try to stack a number of these layers where neurons um, do some certain computations and weight store um, some trained values. And as we go from you know, the natural image um, through the first layer, it tries to extract some edges and they can combine the edges to learn more small objects. And some of these small objects down the road could be further combined to, for example, identify different types of cars and then you can, you know, classify what specific car it was. So essentially higher level features are being formed with lower level features. Um, and at the end, we want to make a classification or inference of um, a category, for example. And there are some distinctions that we need to understand on the DNN training uh, and DNN inference. So this is a you know example of a Google Net um, kind of an old network proposed by Google. So this is another you know image classification example. So at the end we want to present some kind of image like this, and we want the machine to classify that it's an espresso, for example. So to do this um, from scratch, we have to do and go through the training process, um, and typically. This is done kind of one time or once in a while and done offline with uh, high end GPUs is the de facto mechanism. But to do this, we need a lot of label data. And then what we have to go through is we have to, you know, present some images from the training data set, kind of present it through the network that we want to train, go to the end, and we know the label or the, you know, ideal value of the classification. And, if it you know, first uh, made an inference incorrectly and there will be some loss and we want to back propagate this so that all the weights that were initially set can be trained and optimized to do this you know, image classification or different inference workloads um, more accurately. And there always have been you know, progression of larger and larger and larger networks coming out you know, previously millions of weights, whereas a large network nowadays billions of weights and it can keep growing. So whichever, you know, reasonable or high-end GPUs you use, there are always going to be some large networks that can take not only multiple days, um, even weeks, um, even with the most powerful GPUs at hand. And the inference or classification, let's say after the training is done, we can do this in real time and as I said, training is typically done, you know, one time or just once in a while. Um, and then inference, we can still want to do it at any arbitrary, you know, time, whenever would we take a picture with our smartphone, we want the machine to do the classification right away. So in these, you know, some of the real time aspects like the latency kind of low power are important. Um, and these can pose limits, but the you know, computation wise, once we um, pose like a picture here, we just go through the feed forward. Um, and then at the end, we just classify out of you know, 100 or 1000 categories what this was, and that will be the answer that's given by this machine for this task. 
So among these um, different DNNs that I uh, briefly presented in a couple slides ago, one of the dominant um, and most popular arguably network is the convolutional neural network um, and or CNNs. So deep, you know, convolution neural networks also try to stack these layers, right? Um, from the beginning, like an input image goes through and then we try to grab the low level features. We want to use those to extract the mid-level and high level features. So a lot of convolution layers um, are stacked and some small ones can just have a few. Some very large ones can have more than thousands of layers. Um, and then it's not just convolution, which is a linear operation, but there's, that, there's um, quite some nonlinear operations that are added in between that helps the network to learn um, a lot of these operations. For example, the nonlinear activations such as ReLU or Sigmoid, there are different types of normalization operations, the most popular one being batch norm nowadays. And then also, you know, several different types of pooling operations or subsampling where we try to reduce the data, you know, we select the max out of certain number or we just average it and then use a small, um, small data to move forward. Typically after stacking a lot of these convolution layers, we have several fully connected layers at the end, which is um, neurons are in a vector form and weights are in a matrix form. So we go through a vector matrix uh, multiplication and then it also has some nonlinear operations, every layer, um, because these are heavy on the weights, um, modern networks typically don't have many fully connected, maybe just have one, for example, while there still has been a lot of progression on uh, having many more convolution layers. So as a result, you know, convolutions, which is essentially a lot of multiply and accumulate um, operations account for more than 90% of the total computations or operations in a given um, DNN nowadays. So this is a, you know, survey of some, you know, recent um, state of the art DNNs um, for ImageNet data set, right? So ImageNet is a data set where there are a thousand uh, image categories. And then when we say a top one accuracy, it means that the given algorithm or the DNN, you know, model needs to, when an image is presented, it needs to predict um, the answer and whatever the top answer, top one answer is, how accurate that is, where compared to the golden answer, we're um, characterizing it here. So there are several things to look into in this plot. So, you know, the x-axis, I mean, basically all the data points here are different models um, or different DNN algorithms for this ImageNet classification task. The x-axis here is the number of max, number of multiply and accumulate operation in order of billions. So, for example, to go through one image till the output, how many operations we have to go through, they are, you can see that those are in the order of billions of operations. And then you can see that each data point has a different circle size, and that represents how many parameters or how many weights are there for a given network. Obviously, still, for one inference path, when an image is given, we have to go through all these weight, you know, we have to load it from somewhere, do the, you know, Mac and convolution with them. And then those are in the order of millions. You can see that there are some small circles, you know, a couple millions of um, weights and some larger circles, like tens of millions of weights. They have these trade off of um, accuracy um, versus how much memory or computation we have to go through. Some other distinctions are they're more, you know, automatic or auto ML techniques where we also use some, you know, machine learning algorithms to automatically select like which, you know, exact uh, layer type, the formation of these neural network structure versus, you know, there has been more traditionally handcrafted um, networks. So you can see some of the distinctions there. Uh, but overall, we have these kind of trade off, obviously, we want to keep pushing this. Uh, I mean, algorithm people will be keep pushing this to get as high accuracy as possible with as low memory and computation as possible. That's an ongoing problem. Um, on the hardware side, we, I mean, these are algorithms, right? So, and these are not necessarily all, um, you know, devised considering where exactly to map some of them can be just programmed onto GPU and run on a given GPU. 
more often than not, you know, especially for embedded applications, mobile applications, we want to customize it uh, because they typically have specific power, energy, and area constraints. So there's going to be some power. We cannot always run like 200 watts of power like a GPU um, on an embedded platform, depending on which platform it is. And mobile will have obviously much more stringent requirements and different area storage requirements, how, how large of a model we can use and how much like off-chip memory, you know, DDR, um, HBM type of access we really need. So, so the question, you know, as hardware designers on especially DNN, you know, hardware accelerator, we want to answer is how do we achieve high performance and energy efficient DNN hardware considering all these, you know, new algorithm advances and this is a 2020 paper, obviously, you know, new papers are keep coming out if we look at try to revisit this plot even now or next year, some of the landscapes will be different. You know, this is just for image classification, but obviously more, you know, new workloads, emerging algorithms will keep coming out. So, and then as we know, there are several different hardware platforms like, you know, FPGA, GPU, ASIC. So which hardware platform are we going to use to map these DNN algorithms is another question we really need to answer. So as we know, GPU is the de facto for the training um, work, the end training workload. We pretty much use all different ty types of GPUs for the you know, um, training on the edge or cloud or really high performance servers. But DNN, for DNN inference, arguably GPU might not be an ideal solution, especially when models employ a lot of sparsity or some custom and irregular um, work data patterns and um, customized architectures. And we'll look into this more. Um, on the other hand, there's these application specific integrated circuits or custom chip designs, right? And we can tailor, you know, ASIC chips for specific algorithms from the previous slide. And they will certainly have the highest energy efficiency, much higher typically than GPUs or ASIC, but one of the key um, downside um, or concerns of ASIC that we need to consider is that the configurability is limited and you can add configurability certainly in ASICs, but you know, those will all also result in overhead and then the customization versus programmability is always a, you know, not easily solvable trade-off. Um, but you know, when, you, when you don't have you know, much configurability and we don't know which algorithms are gonna come out next year. There might be drastically different architectures. And if you're ASIC, you know, obviously are trying to design hardware, you know, understanding the current state-of-the-art algorithm, you want to uh, optimize for that. And if you're, you know, ASIC design that was designed last year that come out now, but new algorithms, um, you know, evolved and they are not really well supported in ASICs, then there is a risk of, you know, being obsolete in a premature manner um, due to the fact that these algorithms and model architecture really evolve significantly over time, as we have seen um, in recent years, you know, and with these DNA algorithms evolving at a very fast pace, there is a risk of ASIC designs that will always lag behind the cutting edge, um, not only because they are, you know, not as reconfigurable as the other platforms, but also because of the fact that the design cycle and design time is, you know, really long. You have to go through all these um, circuit design, synthesis, clicks and route, the, you know, just to get the chip fabricated at a foundry will take like three, four months. Um, and to characterize that and everything uh, will take additional time. So the design cycle is long. A lot of man, manpower and, you know, human efforts are needed too. So considering these um, FPGAs arguably actually have a very unique advantage. So compared to GPUs, they have higher energy efficiency and lower power. Um, and then compared to ASICs, you know, we can program it with this very high configurability. And once it's done, actually, you know, in the matter of, you know, once the design is done, we don't have to have this you know, fabrication cycle because the FPGAs are already fabricated. We just need to program it to the device. So the time to market is certainly very fast, um, especially compared to ASICs. And arguably considering these, you know, model architectures evolving over time, 
we might get much longer useful lifetime out of the device um, compared to ASICs when using the FPGA. So to that, to these, you know, um, aspects, there has been a number of FPGA, you know, research and development um, using Intel and Xilinx FPGAs. And I believe there will be um, continuous um, evolution and uh, advancement on the hardware side of FPGA accelerators for DNNs down the road. So let's first go through some very basics of the FPGA. So, you know, FPGA started from this programmable array logic or PAL architecture where the, you know, <clears throat> uh, array of AND logics, right, were feeding an array of OR logic and the crosses were reconfigurable switches and if we, can, it, I mean, it, these can be arbitrarily selected, so they can be used to program any Boolean expression as a two-level sum of product um, functions. And um, that has been grabbed from the Circuits and System Magazine article by University of Toronto. And that, I mean, in recent years, there with the CMOS scaling, you know, going down to um, double and single-digit nanometer nowadays, there has been definitely a lot of evolution on the commercial FPGA devices, um, as you know, has been uh, driven by Xilinx and Intel, right? So let's first look into the memory on the left side. So you can see that, you know, the trends in memory starting from very old, like, you know, 350 nanometer, 1995, down to uh, much more recent um, Intel Agilex architecture. And you can see that the memory bits um, per logic element certainly increase a lot um, as you go here. Um, and not only deep learning, but a lot of the data intensive workloads, definitely we need to store the data. A lot of these neural network need intermediate storage. So there's always um, this memory wall so-called or a lot of demand for storage. So it's certainly understandable that the storage requirements um, and the uh, storage cap capacity in FPGAs has been growing over the years. On the other side, we need very, I mean, much more efficient, um, you know, computation on the FPGAs as well. And we have arbitrary logic elements, um, you know, for example, the ones we saw in the previous slide, and there has been, you know, advancement on those logic elements as well, but there are also some dedicated, you know, um, logic pieces in FPGAs, namely the DSPs, right? So DSP blocks also has been evolved a lot in Intel and, you know, Xilinx FPGAs. Um, you can see that on the same article by University of Toronto, they highlighted the new features in red when we go from the 2001 to 9 to 13, all the way to more most recent Intel Stratix 10 NX FPGA in 2020. So there has been a lot of different, um, you know, first of all, much more DSP slices starting from, you know, tens of hundreds down nowadays to more than like thousands and, you know, high number of thousands of FPGA, I mean, DSP slices can be found in large scale FPGAs and, you know, different precisions from, you know, 32 bit, 16 bit, some of these, uh, you know, um, beef float and lower precision floating point and fixed point operations DSPs not only are fixated to one, but they can be broken down into multiple slices using the same hardware. So there's a lot of more precision support, you know, different um, demands of computation support that you can see has been present in more recent FPGAs. So that's a quick introduction on the algorithm and the basics of the FPGA. And now let's um, go into some details on the DNN inference on FPGAs. But before we go here, maybe I can have a quick stop. Um, it's mo it has been mostly on the basics and introduction, but if uh, anybody has a question, I can try to answer it before we go into some details of DNN inference on FPGAs. Okay, if not, um, I'll move on to the DNN inference on FPGAs. And yeah, please, if you have any questions, um, you can put in the chat and we'll take care of them um, at a certain later chunk. Right, so yeah, sorry that I didn't uh, put it, uh, put the citation information here, but as I mentioned uh, verbally, this is a IEEE circuits and system magazine. Um, and there was a recent <clears throat> special issue on FPGA 
acceleration. And this is an article by um, Professor Von Betz Group at University of Toronto. Yeah, if there is a chance later on where I can uh, distribute a updated version of the slides, um, yeah, maybe I didn't, uh, unfortunately, uh, apologize, but didn't you know, include all the citation informations, but I can make sure that every slide has a proper citation and uh, maybe if there's a chance I can distribute that to the attendees of this um, lecture. Okay, so let's move on to the DNN inference on FPGAs. So let's first look into some details of the you know, convolution parameters and loops and computations in a given CNN. So typically a convolution layer will have input feature maps and output feature maps. And to get the output feature maps, we have to convolve the input feature maps with the set of weights or kernels. And there are several loops and <clears throat> for the, to clarify and everybody in different papers, you know, we'll loop and we will use different notations, but, you know, at least for this lecture, let's um, kind, kind of get settled down on a specific terminology. So just um, follow me here. So let's say we have a convolution like a three by three, and then that has to be, for example, placed on top of a portion of the input feature map, which is typically much larger than three by three. And then we have to do element wise multiplication and addition of a three by three kernel. So there will be like nine convolution multiplications and we have to add them together. And then this Mac within a kernel window, uh, we're gonna call that you know, the first loop or loop one. Then um, there are multiple input feature maps. For example, there could be 100 of feature map um, and that's signified as NIF, the number of input feature maps. And then we have to do all these, you know, same position kernel on top of all these input feature maps. And these different four kernels here are all going to have different values and they have to place, they have to be placed on top of the corresponding input feature maps to the convolution on their own um, and accumulated, that will be loop two. And then, right, so once they get accumulated, that will be a single pixel on this orange output feature map, right? And then you can see that there are other colored, you know, kernel sets as well. And those are for different output feature maps. So for example, for the green output feature map here, we have to pretty much do the same thing that we did in loop two, just with a different kernel and using the same input feature map. So we do the you know, feature map kernel um, convolution, add them all up, that will be a single pixel here. Then we have another set of output feature and kernel maps and do the same thing. That will be a single um, point here. So you can see that we will, we will have the number of kernel sets um, proportional to the number of output channels or output feature maps here. And to get all the, for a given output feature map, obviously we have to scroll this kernel from the top left all the way to, you know, to the end of that row, go down, next row, next row, next row, all the way to the very end. And that will be, um, you know, scanning and going through this all the operations within one input feature map so that we can get all the um, pixels in a given output feature map that is loop three. And then we have to go, we have to basically do that across all the output feature maps of NOF. <clears throat> so that will be loop four. And going through loop one, two, and three, and four will basically conclude the overall convolution operations for a given layer. So um, there are several, I mean, we have all these loops and there are some known loop optimization techniques, namely loop unrolling. So we, have, we want to, you know, when we map these onto hardware, we want to unroll some loops, mean, meaning that we want to do parallel computation of certain, you know, Mac operations in these convolution layers. And that will involve some of, you know, storage, local storage and register arrays and processing engine architecture usually using the um, DSP units in the FPGA. And then loop tiling is re with regards to the data locality. So as I said, typically um, there are gonna be always some very large you know, DNNs and more often than not, 
um, they might not be able to restore the whole thing onto the on-chip memory of the FPGA, then we have to decide and select how much you know, chunk of data are we going to store in an on-chip buffer at a given time um, to trade off this data locality versus storage. And then finally, the loop interchain. So the four loops that I showed in the previous slide you know, doesn't really need to be you know, we have to do loop one first and then loop two. I mean, these are interchangeable. Um, so that means that, you know, as a designer, when we design, you know, these key architectures, we have to decide what will be the optimal kind of order that we're going to compute all these uh, four convolution loops. Okay, so there are going to be some parameters and design variables when we do this type of um, loop optimization. So the N are um, kind of defined that these are the convolution dimensions. So these are basically the um, parameters and dimensions provided by the algorithm. So algorithm will define, okay, for a given layer, how many input feature maps, how many output feature maps, what's the kernel size, those will be given. And then, but from the hardware point of view, we have to decide, you know, loop tiling. So basically how much local data we're gonna store at a given layer um, for the FPGA um, and either, you know, if we want to store a lot of memory layers, then we are kind of forced to use a very large and, you know, maybe more expensive FPGA. We can, you know, use a more, you know, mid-scale FPGA with lower cost, for example, but that will obviously involve more object memory access, for example, more frequent number of them, and there might be less reuse possibilities. So those obviously have to be, you know, thought through. And then P is related to the um, hardware parallelism where we have to decide, okay, out of all the four loops, which loops or which parts of the loops are we gonna unroll so that those unrolled loops are going to be computed in parallel. Um, and typical notations are obviously N is provided by the algorithm, you know, out of those, um, some of that, some port parts of it will be stored you know, on chip on the FPGA, and it could be up to the total n, depending on the you know dimensions of the original you know network that we're trying to implement in hardware. And out of the you know locally tiled and stored um, dimensions, we can decide: Are we gonna you know do like fully parallel operations of everything we stored, or we can do you know, still there might not be that much hardware for, you know, entirely parallel operations. So we can do parts of it in parallel and then, you know, go through the data chunk by chunk, for example. So first the uh, loop, you know, let's go through some of these loop unrolling um, for starting from loop one. So again, loop one was for a three by three kernel, you know, we want to unroll this and do nine multiplications in parallel and do the accumulation. So it's going to involve this individual pixel, like the input feature map pixel and weight multiplications. And for a two by two, we have four things that we unroll for a three by three or five by five, we'll have nine and 25 multipliers that we need in parallel. And then we will have an adder tree where we need to accumulate four, nine or 25 results. And then we will have a <clears throat> accumulator where we want to accumulate new results on top of some previous ones and so on. In terms of loop two, that is across the input feature dimension, right? So we will need these, you know, if we have, let's say out of the NIF, the total number of input feature maps, let's say we are going to parallelize this um, certain number of fe input feature map parallelization. And that means that we will have PIF uh, multipliers here, and again, we will have some adder tree. And then um, unrolling loop three, you know, loop three was, you know, scrolling this kernel across the entire given um, input feature map so that we can get all the pixels on the output feature map. And then in this case, you know, the kernel is the same, and then we have to provide different input pixels that are going to be convolved with the same um, convolution kernel or weights, right? So we can, you know, the weight can be reused PIX and PYY times if, you know, for a given input feature map dimension, let's say PIX pixels and PIY pixels, we're going to parallelize, right? So we will have that many multipliers as well as accumulators. And then finally, unrolling loop four um, will involve you know, there are all these uh, parallel um, and different sets of kernels that 
correspond to different output feature maps um, or POF, right? So if we're going to parallelize on the output feature map dimension, then we are basically computing these output pixels from different output feature maps in parallel. And that will involve POF multipliers as well as accumulators. Okay, so <clears throat> in summary, um, loop unrolling will define, you know, we can have these from the loop one, two, and three, four that are color coded here. You can have all these different um, parallelization factors. And then, you know, if we do some, you know, loop unrolling from loop one, two, three, and four, the total number of parallel maps that we need in the FPGA is going to be, um, you know, a multiplication of all these, you know, P factors um, that we decided from loop one to loop four. And then loop tiling wise, um, input pixel buffer, we, depending on, you know, the parallelization and unrolling of loop two and loop three, <clears throat> and then the local storage amount, you know, that will decide how much storage we need to store all the input pixels in the local buffer. And that will also depend on the bit precision of the input. Uh, and the weight buffer, similar manner, uh, depending on the local storage and tiling of the kernels, the um, input feature map, output feature map, and depending on the weight bit precision. And then finally, on the output side, it will depend on the you know local you know tiling of the output x o and um, how many channels we're going to have. Um, again, kind of multiplied by the output bit precision. And then loop interchange um, is the intra-tile order and inter-tile order. So basically we have to decide, you know, out of the loop one, two, three, four, which one are gonna, you know, do first. Um, and that's gonna also involve which, you know, loops we're gonna unroll and do parallel versus which loops we're gonna do in more series fashion. So the intra-tile, you know, within a tile, there's still, you know, um, there could be different uh, computations that we need to decide, and that's going to, you know, govern the memory hierarchy uh, within the tile structure. You know, which ones are going to first try to deliver to the PE to do the computation, and that will involve some, you know, global, you know, like VRAM or SRAM buffer to, you know, intermediate registers to the PEs where the computation is actually happening. And then, you know, you know, higher level, we still have some external memory, and then we have to first load them into the global um, SRAM buffer, um, and that will decide, you know, which chunk of data we want to first load it um, for the intra tile. And then we want to um, some several there, there are going to be, I mean, these are all these, you know, design parameters right and then um things we can do and as i'm trying to illustrate here those are going to result in different parallel hardware computation requirements as well as you know local storage requirements but you know there has to be certain objectives right so some you know common objectives that fpga accelerator use first will be you know some minimization of the partial sum storage so to understand this um we're going to you know do this multiplications and there's going to be some different unrolling factor and parallelization and we're going to store it here but let's say we're doing like an 8-bit precision so all the input pixels are 8-bit kernel weights are 8-bit and the final output feature map um, this is going to be 8-bit right but um, when we do all this multiplication and accumulation this cannot be um, clipped at 8-bit i mean in the middle we have to do this depending on how many um, input map we're doing with, there could be <clears throat> like a 24 bit, 16 bit, 32 bit, different types of precision that are necessary, right? So that means that this partial sum will actually have higher precision than any given input weight or output pixel bit precision. So that means that we do want to minimize some of these partial sum storage, right? Um, and in other words, it might be beneficial that this partial sum is not necessarily moved around, you know, too much, right? So when we go through these um, uh, kind of flow flow chart that has been presented at uh, FPGA 2017, um, and we can see that, you know, depending on where we are unrolling it, right? And then we can 
do some first-hand calculation um, and analysis on what is the partial sum requirement. And then depending on some other you know, parts where we go through some different loops, then we can find out what the partial sum requirement um, here will be, right? And you know, if, for example, um, both loop one and loop two are fully unrolled, right? So what was loop one and loop two again? So loop one was the you know, three by three um, within kernel and loop two was across all the input pixels, right? And that, if we do loop one and loop two, what did that result in? That resulted in the single pixel value here, right? And then the next pixel is a new set of, you know, um, convolutions, basically where we have to multiply a different input, you know, pixels with the same kernel. Or for different output feature maps, it's different set of kernels with the same input feature maps. But at least if the loop one and two, um, there's going to be no partial sum because if we go through loop one and two and then some nonlinear activation functions, that's the final product, I mean, final result of this output feature map pixel, right? So that's what we're saying here about if we unroll, fully unroll both loop one and loop two, we don't really need to store the partial sum in a separate like on-chip VRAM or global um, SRAM buffer. And uh, that could be good because otherwise you have to do some partial sum and uh, that's not the full sum. So you have to, you know, first bring it to a different, you know, SRAM or VRAM storage. And when you're coming back to the full sum, you have to load again the partial sum and do the rest of the computation, do the continuous, um, partial sum and full sum accumulation. So that's something to think about. And then if the loop one and two are also fully buffered, for example, you know, even if I want to fully unroll it, I mean, to do the fully unroll computation, obviously you need to have all the input pixels and weights that are necessary to do the fully parallel loop one and two computation, which means that all of those can just be, cannot be just sitting at the external, like, you know, DDR or DRAM memory. They have to be fully buffered and be there inside the FPGA. Only then we can really consume the partial sum within one tile, right? So basically the one thing to, uh, you know, consider is that the earlier loop one and loop two are computed, the smaller partial sum can be. And again, partial sum is definitely going to have much higher precision than all of the other input weight and output. So that could be good. That could be good, that could be good from the, not only the storage, from, but from the memory access energy point of view. Um, because otherwise, as I said, the partial sum have to be kept, you know, across different tiles, right? And, you know, we, uh, and we cannot exploit this kind of benefit of, you know, being able to use smaller partial sum. And then uh, let's um, also go through the, you know, reducing possibly the buffer access by data reuse. So um, this obviously has been, you know, presented by many different data flows, but um, just in case um, some of you are not fully familiar, let's go through this um, data reuse concept. So the point about data reuse is that, you know, once we load a weight or once we load a given pixel, it's not just exclusive, okay, I'm gonna multiply the given pixel to this weight value and then that's it. I mean, it's not that those weights are not gonna be used you know, anywhere else. In fact, actually on the other, I mean, in the contrary, the same weights are going to be multiplied with all the different input pixels in this input feature map. And also the input feature maps will be multiplied with all different um, kernel weights too, right? So there is definitely um, some reuse possibility because let's say this is where the actual computation is happening. That means that we have to load the input pixels and the weight values from somewhere. I mean, essentially from the global SRAM and uh, you know, eventually from the external DRAM, right? So when we have to load it from the DRAM, obviously it's good that we exhaustively use this specific weight value so that we don't have to load it um, again, from the global, you know, large SRAM buffer, let alone the external DRAM, because that's going to be much more latency and energy hungry, right? So ideally, once we load it and one, once it's there at the 
you know, DSP or P array where the actual computation is happening, we want to reuse it as much as possible so that we are multiplying everything that is really needed from this given um, weight or input pixel values, okay? So if we, you know, define the reuse times of a pixel of this reuse underbar px, and let's say if we unroll um, loop four versus like if we loop if we fully unroll loop one and loop three, there's going to be different reuse factors. So for example, in the loop four case, if like the you know loop one is not unrolled at all, then the, we can reuse it for pof times when we generate you know these. Uh, POF parallel output feature channels. And then in case of loop one and loop through are fully unrolled, it will have some you know, more complex um, equations, but you can see that from the total um, parallelization factor, how many of them are common um, and then how many of them we have to still reload it once again due to the other unrolled loops, I mean, other loops that are not unrolled. So this will be the reuse you know, PX for the loop one and three unrolled scenario. So, um, and the other objective that is definitely important from the FPG acceleration is to minimize the external memory access. Right? So, you know, the weights and the intermediate results of the pixels or feature maps um, can be stored in external memory. Um, and obviously there are gonna be always some large scale, you know, CNNs. And there's obviously a range of different FPGAs. Obviously, in the other you know, extreme case, if the CNN is very small and we're trying to use a large FPGA, then everything can fit in a, you know, a given FPGA and we might not even use any external memory. But there's always going to be the other cases where we want to really map a large CNNs, but not necessarily with the state-of-the-art FPGA. Um, that are costly, or even with the very largest FPGA, there's always going to be some, you know, DNNs that cannot fully fit inside one chip. You saw like, you know, tens of megabits, um, and depending on the precision, and there's billions of weights in some very large models. So there's always going to be some large networks that cannot fit in one FPGA. Um, so this external memory access, how do we, you know, characterize that, analyze that, and minimize that is very important. So the minimum access of the external memory will be what we, you know, if we assume first that <clears throat> the weights and the pixels are, you know, for as a given fact are stored in the external memory. And then let's say we have to load them. We have to first load them inside the FPGA. And then eventually we have to, you know, bring it to where the computation actually happens. So that means that we definitely need to read every pixel and weight at least once, but the minimum access obviously would be we just read only once. And <clears throat> excuse me. Read, read them only once, right? And that means that actually we will need a sufficiently large on chip global or DRAM buffer inside the FPGA. And also, um, we would need some proper loop computing orders just by the fact that we, you know, have a sufficiently large one. If the orders are not really aligned um, nicely, then we might, you know, being in a situation where even, even with the same size of relatively large on-chip buffer, we are doing this first. And then although the full sum computation, you know, there's some remaining tasks, we're doing some other things first, and then these are mix and match, then we have to, you know, use the on-chip buffer for relatively large partial sum storage and other uh, additional external memory access and so on, okay. Um, and in terms of the min uh, minimizing the access of the external memory, we can do some similar first-hand calculations uh, that is also from the same FPGA 2017 paper. So we can characterize the number of DRAM reads for one input pixel in a layer and the number of DRAM reads of one weight in a given layer, right? So you can first um, start from the local tiling, um, how many uh, pixels we are buffering and how many weights we are buffering, right? Obviously we want to you know, do it you know, only once, but we at least to start from that. And then, you know, depending on whether all the required weights um, are buffered or not, 
uh, and pixels are buffered or not, we will you know, count them and we have to go through some additional loops of computation and reloading if necessary. Um, and depending on, again, whether we do like loop, compute, loop four computation first or other loop computation first, um, there could be additional um, DRAM PX and DRAM WT increase in how many number of times we have to read it from the external memory. So <clears throat> for high performance and high energy efficiency accelerator, we certainly some high level concepts that we definitely need to understand is that we want to fully utilize the existing computation resources in the FPGA. And we, if we have you know, a certain number of DSP units or a number of logic elements units we're using for the processing engine of the DNN, like the convolution and other pooling and others, we don't, <clears throat> the FPGA hardware is there, right? So we want to fully utilize them. And when we run a given network from the end to end, from layer one to layer N, then throughout the overall layer computation, we want to ideally maintain high utilization of all the uh, resources in the FPGA. Um, in, from the memory hierarchy point of view, similar to you know, other accelerators um, and the conventional memory system, we will have at least um, three levels of hierarchy in an FPGA <coughs> excuse me, um, acceleration system. So that will involve um, external memory. For example, DRAM or HBM, we will have gigabytes or larger memory, and that should be sufficient um, to store all the weights um, for notable DNNs. And then there's going to be some on-chip buffer um, in the orders of megabyte, typically. And this will be <clears throat> some SRAM or VRAM on-chip buffer storage. And then we are have to bring that much more closer to where the actual computation happens, namely like the processing engines or PEs and there will be some local, relatively small amount of flip-flops and latches and registers um, that will feed in the data um, in a shifting or circulating manner, circulating manner to the PEs. Okay. So this is some um, you know benchmarking um, using the, um, the you know for example analysis that we did um, and then some of the actual um, DRAM accesses that we can count. So this could be a you know, case study like this, that for example, previous um, Intel Area 10 FPGAs had tens of megabit of on-chip memory, right? Um, so those will be here. And then you can see that depending on the on-chip buffer size, how many like local tiling we use for a given um, you know, input pixel and weight kind of storage, you can see that Obviously, if the buffer size is smaller and smaller, we have to inevitably have more higher number of DRAM accesses. And then because, because of that, the delay of the convolution layers will increase as well. But at a certain point for a given CNN, if you have you know, a relatively sufficient size of the on-chip buffers, which happens to be under, um, for example, some of these mid-scale FPGA you know, on-chip storage require, I mean, capacity, then you can see that the total number of DRAM accesses and convolution layer latency is saturating here. So those could be some design point locations that we can match the you know, first-hand analysis as well as some synthesized design um, measurements from the FPGA. So these are the trade-off of you know, on-chip storage versus off-chip communication. Okay. So let's first go through some loop optimizations that has been um, provided and sorry. So in the relevant work. So in some works, for example, they try to unroll loop one, loop two, and loop four, um, as you can see here. So Loop one was again the convolution kernel. Loop two was across the input feature map, and loop four was across the output feature map, right? To a certain degree. So that will involve the PKX, PKY for the loop one, PIF for loop two, and then POF for loop four. Okay. Uh, and so unrolling, oh, sorry, unrolling loop one will employ the parallelism within the kernel maps, right? And typically this is pretty small, right? Like three by three, five by five. Um, and 
To that end, just by loop one obviously cannot provide sufficient parallelism. And one more thing to think about is that, you know, even for a given, you know, network, right, the kernel size from layer one all the way to layer n can be different. Um, only some specific networks like VGG might have a very regular three by three kernel across all the layers, but, you know, different uh, modern CNNs might have some, some in five by five, some in three by three, some in one by one. So kernel sizes can vary across different convolution layers and that can impose some imbalance of the workloads and difficulty in mapping this P in a regular manner. In other words, <clears throat> they try to unroll loop two, loop four or loop one and loop three, um, right? So different input and output feature maps and kernel and across all the pixels in a given feature map. So the, you know, some designs only unrolled loop four across the output dimension and some designs like type C try to unroll like loop one and loop three. Um, and, but this, you know, loop C obviously once you involve loop one unrolling, you know, it's affected by the issue of, you know, this different kernel sizes across different layers, for example. Loop Different type of um, uh, you know papers also try to unroll loop three and loop four. So in here, loop three was you know scrolling across the given input feature map, and loop four was across different channels of output um, feature maps, right? So they try to reuse the pixels uh, by unrolling loop three, uh, and this certainly is large to provide sufficient parallelisms. Um, but some of the data tiles, you know, do not necessarily cover loop two, and that can, you know, increase the movements as well as storage for this more higher precision partial sums. Okay, so let's go through a case study um, in case where we try to, you know, uh, unroll the loops um, by POX, POY, and POF while keeping this um, P kx, pky, and pif to one, right? So in this case, you know, the issues of um, the different layers having different kernel sizes, we don't, are not bounded by that. And then pif um, is there, it's just that we fully buffer it, right? So the tkx, tky is equal to nkx, nky, and tif is equal to nif, but we try to reuse pixels by unrolling loop three and loop four um, respectively. So, you know, plugging in these numbers like 14 by 14 by 16 will result in about 3,100 PEs and um, large scale FPGAs. And depending on the precision, we can divide a given DSP into multiple um, computations like this. And given, you know, some large size of DSPs available in modern FPGAs, these can be, you know, supported. This kind of large parallelization factor can be supported by um, recent FPGAs as well. So loop tiling wise, if we <clears throat> fully buffer loop one and loop two, then we can get rid of the partial sum storage and movement concern. Uh, and we are just, you know, absorbing all the partial sum there. So it don't, we don't have to move it around. We don't have to store it in additional places. Uh, and we also want to ensure if possible, every pixel and weight are read only once from the DRAM. So once we are fully buffering it um, and then uh, <clears throat> using quite some storage for the, uh, the loop three as well, then we want to make sure that if possible, don't necessarily have to read it again from the DRAM. Right? And loop interchange wise in this case study, um, we're trying to serially compute loop one and loop two first while we unroll loop three and loop four for more parallel computations. And this is because uh, we want to first um, consume our partial sums as soon as possible, right? So let's go through some more detailed uh, analysis step-by-step step, and I believe this can help understand uh, more exactly what's going on and you know similar approaches exist in other prior works and you know variants of this can be expanded into similar or expanded data flow uh, for FPGA acceleration. So first, right, um, the M star denotes a MAC unit. So for example, M21, um, this is just you know signifying the X um, uh, X and Y coordinates from this input feature map point of view. 
Um, and then, as you know, for a three by three kernel, right? Let's say one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is the three by three kernel values. And then if we put this three by three kernel on top of this portion of the feature map, when we do the nine multiplications and, you know, add or tree accumulation, then we're going to have the final results stored in this specific location of the given output feature map, right? So because, as I said, in this um, example case study, we're going to do the serial computation of the kernel map, which means that, for example, across nine clock cycles, we're going to do the um, multiply accumulate one by one. So for example, in this given MAC unit, right? There's a, this is a single MAC unit. Um, and then obviously to do that, we have to load the pixels, this 0, 11, 12, 22, you know, from the local buffer supposedly. And then the weights obviously have to come from somewhere. But let's say in cycle zero, right? We're multiplying this zero pixel here and the uh, one weight here. And in the next second cycle, clock one, we're going to multiply this 11 pixel here and two weight, you can see here. And, you know, third cycle, you know, sixth cycle will be 22 pixel with six weight. And then finally in the ninth cycle, 32 pixel with the nine weight, right? And then we're doing this, you know, we're reusing the same multiplier in this single MAC unit for this nine, multiplications one by one, and then we'll keep accumulating it, right? So if we use nine cycles with the same multiplier hardware, then we basically did all the partial sums for a given three by three kernel, right? We have to still do it for the input feature map for a given three by three kernel. We did everything that is needed, right? Now, if we're done with this, then obviously we have to move the kernel map one pixel to the right. Right, and this will be the new output pixel locations, and we basically do the same thing. Weight is not changed, but the input pixels are different. So we do one by one uh, multiplication, and then get the final value after nine cycles. And then, then we move the kernel map again one pixel to the right again, and then we will get you know the do this. And please note that you know this was M twenty one. Um, here, we're going to do that in a different multiplier unit. And then here, we're going to do that in a yet different multiplier unit. Uh, but you can see here that different out input pixels are loaded, right, cycle by cycle. And then they're still multiplied with the same weight because that's how it's being done in a given input feature map, right? And now if we put these three together, M21 and 22 and 23, and where we put this, you know, three by three sliding window across three output pixel locations, we can see, you know, what is necessary um, for the input pixel loading for this three MAC units, right? And you can easily see that these, you know, 11, 12 can, are, can be used again in the very next cycle in a very adjacent MAC unit. And for example, 12 and 13 are reused here. There's quite some reuse opportunity per se, right? Because all these things that are used, I mean, we have to load these input pixels from the global buffer into some local register. And when they are already at the PE array, the MAC array, then, I mean, maybe there's some just, you know, wires that feed in in this very specific manner and shift it from, you know, this M22, 22 M23 to M21 and M22, you know, as shown in this arrow, right? And then you can understand, you know, this was for this given row, right? But we have to do this for the upper row and the bottom row and basically all the rows, right? So if we think this is a middle row, and then if we think about the upper row, right, where we need this, you know, zero, uh, I mean, this three top rows, including like 11, 12, 13, 21, 22, 23, up till there, and 24, for example, and the lower row where it involves like zero, 21, all the way to 44 pixel here, right? And similar thing can be done, obviously, there, right? I mean, the weights are still the same within a given input feature map, but, you know, once we load it, in the very next cycle, we can push some of these, you know, um, input pixels to the next row and so on. And now you can see also that we have three rows of data and not only there is reuse opportunity, you know, within the same row, but if we have a couple additional registers um, per row, for example, because in this, we to fully get this three by three 
value, um, three by three output pixels, we need a five by five window, right? So if we have this five registers per row, and then you can see that, <clears throat> you know, um, this 11, 12, 13 fully, you know, is reused here, but you can see that those are here too. And 22, 23, 23 are first used here in clock, you know, three first clock cycles, but then in the next three clock, they're used here. And also they're used here too, right? So you can see there's much more reuse opportunities, um, not necessarily, not only in the same row, but even from the upper row, middle row, bottom row, you can see that these can be keep being shifted and there's, you know, we can really reuse it because that way, once we load, let's say pixel 11, right? We know that it has to be used in this row as well as this row. So might as well, if we first loaded it, then instead of you know you know using it and then throwing it out and when we're doing this row load it again it's definitely better that we okay load it use it here push it here and then use it here and then if we're done with it okay then then it's okay right so if we think about okay there's going to be like a buffer that stores the input pixels and those have to be loaded to this local registers in the p array right so you can see that um, after here, you know, we first have to obviously load some of these uh, new values and then um, sometimes it's, you know, new values one by one because we're keep shifting it one pixel to the left. So this 23, like 13, we have to load it. And, you know, there's gonna be some cycles that we only need one value. Some other cycles we might need more values to load, but it's a regular pattern that we can have the input pixel buffers designed to be stored in a certain way. And then load it in a certain way so that all these streamline operations can be pipeline and go through, right? And this is also, you know, showing obviously the weight, right? I mean, you know, weight by weight we have to load it. And one thing to note here is that obviously weight one is basically multiplied by all of these different input pixels in clock zero. Weight five is multiplied by all of these pixels, right? In the same. Um, in the same clock cycle, right? So in a sense, in this so-called output stationary data flow, the output pixels are not moving. Basically the same Mac unit is doing the computation to get, let's say all the computations for output pixel 21, for example, right? But to do that, the weights have to be broadcasted to all of the Mac units that are shown here, right? In every cycle, different weights, only a single weight is used for a single clock cycle. But for that cycle, you know, the weight has to be broadcasted to all of these different Mac units. Okay. And now considering this, let's try to think about, okay, how, how do we, you know, design this parallel P architecture, right? So some specific numbers were given were, okay, we're going to unroll the loop through and loop three, loop three and loop four. For loop three, basically we're gonna compute 14 by 14 input pixels in parallel and um, 16 output feature maps in parallel, right? So um, the pixels and weight shared um, by these are in this, in this equation. And again, these are resulting in about 3,136 Mac units that are being computed in parallel. So we have this PIX parallelization, we have to have you know, different input pixels on the y dimension, x dimension first. And then we have the pixels in the y dimension, right? Um, in reality, this will be more of like a regular, you know, DSP array and Mac array, but just from the illustration purposes of where this PIX parallelization, PIY parallelization, and POF parallelization happens um, in different Mac unit structure, uh, it's kind of drawn in this way. <clears throat> so there are things that had to happen, right? So in clock cycle zero, for example, we have to load some new values to these local registers from the on-chip BRAMs and global buffers. And then in the next, you know, cycle one and two, we can go through these, uh, go through these uh, shifting operations within these local registers and then feed the corresponding inputs um, to the Mac unit so that they can do the computation in these you know uh, multi integer multiple of three kind of clock cycles there's more 
um, kind of row-wise data movement um, if these pixel reuse and there are certain you know pattern that these should be you know moved from the input to the you know this row to this middle row to the bottom row here and then as I said the weight you know there's going to be a weight buffer and then some of these weights have to be broadcasted to these Mac units um, for a given cycle different weights but broadcast it to different um, Mac units in the given cycle. Um, the important point about this output stationary data flow is that the partial sum is going to be consumed by each Mac unit, especially exploiting the fact that the FPGAs can have you know, thousands of DSPs that can flexibly support this, then we can basically compute everything within the Mac unit, right? Um, so that the partial sum doesn't have to move outside of this convolution P architecture. And then besides the convolution, obviously there's some other non, you know, Mac or non-convolution operations, um, namely, you know, full pooling and fully connected. And more often than not, different designs have used separate data paths for these pooling, normalization, and so on. So pooling units um, are different, obviously, from convolutions because they don't really need weights. Um, they just receive um, previous um, layer pixels and then just do some average or maximum selection. Um, and then the next, um, next layer weights, I mean, next layer pixels are decided. Fully connected do use Mac units uh, and they can be used the same thing from the convolutions. Uh, it's just they don't have this convolutional reuse factor. So it's just a straight vector matrix multiplications and uh, you know, chance of reusing the weights are not really high at all. Okay, um, but you know, for the pooling, similarly, you know, we have to load these um, pixel buffer values into the local registers. Um, there will be still some computations that are needed out of like the two, four or nine values, we have to select the maximum, or we have to average all those values and select a single value as a pooling output. And to do that, um, we have to have some of the cycle wise, again, kind of data transition data movement um, so that where the comparator or maximum unit is happening, we can do them in a corresponding manner. Okay. All right, so um, next I'm gonna go through some, you know, how do we generate this in a more automatic fashion as well as move on to the low precision quantization and sparse and pruning, but um, maybe I'll have a brief stop and see if there's any um, questions from the audience. Okay, um, if there's not, then let me move on. Um, but yeah, I, I, it'll be really great if you have any questions, it'll be, you know, uh, it could be more interactive, it could be certainly great. Um, okay, so moving on to this high level synthesis and different automatic RTL generation. So I want to touch upon on these aspects because, um, you know, let's say we got all these different architectures that we want to implement, right? So we can um, do custom Verilog and RTL um, implementations and more often than not, they can be much more efficient than some of these high level programming languages. But at the same time, those are very manual, could be very time consuming, especially for beginners is a, quite a learning curve, right? So um, for both Xilinx and Intel FPGA, they have been over the years um, providing some interfaces and ways of we can you know, just program high level uh, languages, uh, namely Xilinx has this high level synthesis or HLS tool. So you can just, you know, write these um, for loops and different, you know, uh, syntax. And you, you can even, you know, have some different unrolling, you know, governed uh, in the hardware aspect. So you can have this mixture of, you know, just pretty much writing down what the algorithm told you, but you know, in certain aspects, you can try to, you know, mix and match certain hardware. Okay, I wanna unroll this, more parallelism here, and so on and so forth. Um, Intel also in, has been having this OpenCL um, language and suite available um, and both this HLS and OpenCL 
you know, over the years, it has been, you know, much more been advancing to a more mature design. Um, and you can basically write like a C code um, um, in, in, and try to implement basically a DNN accelerator um, using the provided OpenCL compiler. And it's going to generate in a synthesizable um, Verilog that can be directly um, synthesized and placed and routed onto the FPGA. Okay. Uh, and besides some of these, you know, tools that are um, supported by both the vendors of uh, Intel and Xilinx, um, there has been also some, you know, researchers and developers coming up with some custom um, new synthesizable RTL generation. So, you know, basically the idea and objective here is that once we get a DNA, I mean, all the objective here is that DNA models are all written in Python, you know, PyTorch, um, TensorFlow, different, you know, of these well-known libraries and languages, right? Um, so ideally we want to just read that. And then if an FPGA design voila comes out, I mean, that's ideally what we want, right? So. Um, in not, not necessarily using some of these um, because maybe someone, you know, some specific, you know, hardware architectures um, could be most well supported if you actually design some of these RTL generation yourself. So there has been several groups that also try to grab, you know, a high level DNN model um, specification in these one of these, you know, well known tools. And then they, you know, generate a graph that takes care of the overall computation and considering the FPGA hardware um, resources and limitations, you will decide how much parallelism and, you know, storage and accelerator core design um, and basically generate a synthesizable and parametrizable Verilog. And that can be directly mapped to the FPGA to, you know, do this. So, Basically, once you get settled down on a specific architecture, right, like this, for example, then you know, you know, depending on the algorithm and a given layer and the FPGA constraints, you can kind of parametrize it and then have an automatic tool, simple tool to generate these Verilogs uh, in a, you know, that matches with what you want to parallelize and implement the given DNN model. So this DNN model too, Synthesizable RTL generation has been another, you know, um, trend of works that has been coming out um, in the literature. So, you know, some more details about, you know, for examples of the RTL generator, um, and this can be done for both like inference or training acceleration. But basically, we can get like a CNN architecture, like the layer details, like the convolution, pooling, upsampling, scaling, you know and then precision of each layer that can be different and layer scheduling. And we initialize the you know, memory and you know, based on the defined loop unrolling, parallelization, tiling, storage factors, right? The hardware basically can, can be configured uh, where you know, it's gonna use some core low level RTL library that is highly parametrized, right? So the RTL generator basically has to combine some of the CNN model architecture and use the correct parametrization considering the parallelization and the local storage computation requirement. And if you do that, then we can get a top level RTL um, with like inference and training hardware and depending on DDR and HBM, um, we can you know, make the FPGA work even with those external memory because those are IPs there already. And then we still have to go through the you know, synthesis and place and route process and then the bitstream mapping, but at least the automatic RTL generation has been looked into a number of these papers as well as um, different groups as well. Okay, um, and then let's look into some further um, low precision um, quantization, sparsity pruning. Basically, we want to map a, you know, larger model uh, with limited FPGA resources and how can we do that? So. A high level overview of you know what is low precision and pruning techniques. Obviously, DNN models can be large, but we want a more compact representation. And there are two main ways we can do that. Number one is instead of you know using like a 32-bit floating point or 16-bit fixed point, even we can use a much more coarse grain representation to 
you know, signify what the weight value is, what the activation value is. And then, you know, that way we don't have to use that many bits to even store them. And also if there were these many weights um, in this kind of distribution format, and then the zero weights, for example, are not really, even if you multiply with zero, partial sum is zero. If you accumulate all the zero, final result is zero. So they don't really affect the output at all. So then why do we need these zero weights? So can we just get rid of them? And then the total storage requirement could be lower and we can combine obviously the pruning and low precision. And then we will only have these kind of, you know, finite number of, you know, weights and activations possible in this kind of distribution where there are not many zero values, right? So compression or sparsity pruning, we try to use less number of total weights by pruning out zero weights as well as maybe activations. And, you know, quantization, low precision wise, we try to use less number of bits per each weight and per each activation. And it's basically discretizing to specific values. And both of them, you can, you know, envision that these can all reduce the storage and energy um, consumptions for a given DNN hardware, um, also for FPGA. So just a quick um, recap on some of the, you know, notable low precision and pruning schemes. So let's say in back in the days, uh, what people have done typically is you just train the DNN using GPUs with like 32 bit or single precision, double precision floating point. And then just once the, once the training is done, we're going to, you know, quantize it with fixed point precision so that inference, inference can be done with these in a more, um, more efficient manner. And then we can obviously sweep the precision like a VGG16 for ImageNet and then try to see where the accuracy starts to really degrade and try to pick a, you know, inflection point. If we do just a naive fixed point versus we, you know, change the integer and fractional, you know, bits for different layers in the same model or do some online adaptation, um, we can, you know, kind of push this Pareto curve so that we can get less number of bits without, you know, much accuracy degradation at all. So the, there's, there has been some, you know, optimization there. And there has been a lot of push, obviously, to even push it down to very, very low precision, even from the algorithm community starting, you know, um, several years ago, pushing it down to binary weight and binary input. Obviously, in the earlier work, there has been quite some degradation on the image net scale, uh, but this has been more improving in more recent binary works. And the key idea here is that if you just do the previous scheme where we just train with floating point and try to binarize it at inference, it's not going to work. So you have to do some in-training quantization or quantization aware training where you do this forward and backward just as if you're doing inference. But some of the gradient calculations and weight updates are still done in floating point precision. Right. But if you do it this way, then when you do inference, the forward is the same, so you can just get it. So, and uh, for all different networks in the literature, like ResNet, um, SqueezeNet, MobileNet, um, for ImageNet, it's not really easy to get down to like a single bit precision without losing, you know, accuracy, at least at the ImageNet scale. And this slide kind of shows it a, re a relatively recent paper. Um, two paper results are kind of combined here, but you can see that you, people have tried to push it down to four bit and two bit precision. Um, inevitably, that when you're when you're at two bit, there's going to be some accuracy degradation, right? Um, and that's not necessarily good. Mobile net type of really compact models by itself is even harder to you know make it low precision as well, like sub four bit. So all of these points here are four bit precision, um, and then. Um, you know, you can see that the model size of these are larger, might be really more favorable, but there's more degradation here when we push it down to four bit, right? But I mean, still using some of these algorithm advancements, um, there has been a number of FPGAs to try to do like binary, you know, neural network acceleration, some of these low precision, more compact acceleration. So FIN is a well-known BNN inference accelerator on FPGA. Um, from several years ago. So this generates an FPGA accelerator in a relatively automatic manner like this HLX tool um, by Xilinx using the Vivado suite. And it uses a trained DNN and tries to extract the DNN topology and parameters and um, get this overall FPGA accelerator mapping done. And 
you know, the performance and energy efficiency benefits of the, you know, BNN hardware has been demonstrated. It also characterized this roofline curve and see, you know, where the BNN really helps in terms of this cut line of the computation and communication um, requirements. But basically, you know, setting aside the accuracy, which is, as I said, keep being improved by different, you know, machine learning researchers also. I mean, if we can get this BNN kind of framework set up, I mean, it's obviously good in terms of hardware because it can fit entirely likely on chip. It's only a single bit for the entire weight, right? And the arithmetic also is very simplified, you know, binary activation multiplied by binary is just an XNOR, not really need to use a full multiplier. And this enables really high, you know, computational performance, low latency and so on. Okay, and let me just, uh, you know, at the stepping out from zooming, obviously I cannot cover all the, you know, FPGA accelerators um, in this relative still, you know, lecture, but I want to still mention several high level trends. Um, so like the fin from the previous work was, you know, for, a, you know, re grabbing some algorithmic advancement, try to map an efficient FPGA accelerator there. But conventionally, you know, how pe people have been doing it usually is that we use an object DRAMs to store all the model parameters. And then typically people perform layer by layer computation in a time multiplex manner. So let's say we just focus on mapping a given layer in the FPGA. Once that layer is done, we grab the waste from the next layer from the DRAM onto the FPGA and do that layer. And we do this n times or an n layer, you know, DNN, then we're done. And more often than not, the throughput is limited by the DRAM bandwidth. This obviously depends also on which option memory we use and the bandwidth there. Um, but there's more frequent DRAM communication, obviously, that introduces high energy consumption and really have to be, you know, nitpicky, I would say, when you read papers um, that, you know, under kind of throughput and energy values is the DRAM latency at least included, not included. I mean, that can actually, you know, if you just look into the FPGA only numbers while at the system level DRAM is involved, that might not really portray the system level aspects of the total latency. So I think from, you know, from practice of reading papers and understanding them point of view, it's really important to find out whether DRAM numbers and off-chip memory for end-to-end -end operations are included or not. Now, because there has been advancement, as I said, mobile net is a very compact model that use these so-called depth-wise separable convolutions. Um, and there's not many ways as much as like VGG and very you know, high, level, high layer resonant models, um, but it can still achieve similar accuracies with much less parameters, right? So if we're talking about only several mega, you know, several million weight parameters, and in the previous slide, we looked at now they are pushing it down to like four bit, you know, four bit values, right? And so that means it's gonna be maybe, you know, tens of megabit, um, less than 20 megabit for the entire mobile net. And that can definitely fit in the onchip memory of mid styles large scale FPGAs, right? So we can, you know, due to some of these algorithm um, advances, as well as there are more large scale FPGAs, there are always more memory demand. So now not only mobile net, but there are a handful of models that the entire weights with reasonable precision can not just, you know, restricted to binary can be actually stored in the total on-chip memory of FPGAs, right? So then that means that for the weight, we don't have to go back and forth with the DRAM. Um, it's just that whenever the given layer we done, we just grab it from the corresponding on-chip global buffer, do the computation in the Mac engine. And then when the new set of um, pixels and feature maps are there, then those can be directly fed in as the next input of the next layer, right? So there has been some of these trends to map the total, you know, DNN onto an FPGA and that will have either no or significantly reduced um, object memory. So for example, this is a, you know, kind of um, categorization. Um, so the first, you know, layer wise is this um, category. So again, you know, we store, you know, one layer of waste on the FPGA. And let's say to do that, we still need two adjacent layers of activations. You know, CNM precision can be 8-bit or lower. Uh, we need, you know, a given layer number of max here, and then the you know multiplication and accumulation implementation must be programmable because it's going to be time multiplex. But that's going to involve you know 
quite high weight DRAM, you know, you know, global SRAM and time multiplexing, but still obviously going to fit on the FPGA. As I said, some of these all weights on chip approaches, you know, try to map the entire CNN on the FPGA. Um, still, we will need like two layers of adjacent activation stored on the FPGA for the activation storage. Um, and we can still only have a single, you know, layer map because we we're, might want to do still layer by layer computation with all weight stored on chip, right? We might, because we might not have that many Macs to do every Mac in parallel and still there's this sequential operation. Um, so we're getting rid of the DRAM in this case, uh, and it can still fit in larger PGAs, but there's going to be some time multiplexing and weight um, global access as well, global buffer access, certainly. So now there has been some further works um, from both Xilinx and uh, my group and others to more parallelize and further you know, streamline some of these um, FPGA works, you know, going further than some of these layer wise and always on chip approaches. But if you try to do it naively, obviously, you know, having, you know, max for all the ways is just prohibitive. There's going to be a very large gap. So some new, you know, ways of thinking about it is that from the FPGA point of view, right, all weights are fixed for the entire DNA. And then when you're able to store all weights on chip, I mean, those weights are not going to be programmed because you have all the weights already. So then can't we just use some fixed weight, right? For example, we just hard code the weights instead of using, you know, um, the, the actual registers or even SRAM bit cells and then use some fixed weight scalar methods to do just use hard code weights. And for this kind of set of weights, the output we know is going to be that. So this way we can do much more parallelization and this way, you know, because we know a priori that which weights are zero, element-wise sparsity are can be actually very friendly supported in this type of new schemes where we map the fixed um, weights in a hard-coded manner. Okay. So, um, for example, this fixed FPGA scheme is one of the new schemes that can use these fixed weight scholars, right? So you can start embedding the fixed point weight into Verilog as literals and simply, you know, use a shift and add between the input and weights. And obviously we don't want to involve any DRAM communications here. And because we can just reprogram it easily without any fixed hardware, I mean, FPGA can be, you know, fixed at a given time, but for different model and different pruning schemes, we can just change it, you know, by a click of a button. So if certain weights are zero, then we just don't map them and don't synthesize them in the FPGA, you know, synthesis and place and process. So actually element-wise sparsity is not really known to be hardware friendly at all, but in these kind of schemes, it can be hardware friendly and we don't really need any indexes either. We just don't store them. So using some of these um, still, I would say in the, even in the very large FPGAs that we're using, you know, um, 1.73 million like ALMs, um, still quite some pruning had to be done where a lot of these fixed point scholar, scalars had to be mapped onto real hardware, right? But um, this way still the entire thing can be mapped with some accuracy degradation. And from the naive scheme, we can get down to this very small um, implementation using this, let's say one of the, you know, uh, recent Intel uh, Stratus 10 GX 10 and FPGA. Um, that employ kind of high sparsity mobile net training. Okay, so those are some, um, you know, relative trends on the quantization and sparsity of these recent works. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If there's not, then maybe I'll just go to the last part about this DNN training on a PGA. All right. Okay, so um, primarily, as I said, most of the FPGA accelerators have been focusing on DNA inference in the AI, you know, workloads. But more recently, there has been also some training accelerators on FPGA, and let's go through some of them as some emerging workloads. So as you know, you know, DNN training GPU is a de facto. So why would we consider um, FPGAs for DNN training? So some aspects is the so-called low batch training. So from the introduction of batch normalization and you know achieving high accuracy for training, you know 
people have been using relatively high batch sizes um, for training. And this actually fits GPU very well. You need you know, a large number of memory and you do this kind of um, parallel hardware computation um, with high GPU utilization. However, um, from the hardware point of view, that's indeed using a lot of activation memory and a lot of computation. And you know, for some more edge device embedded platform DNA training, that's not necessarily good. So people have been looked into more recently low batch size training. And if we do low batch size, it actually there's not much parallelism as much as like the high batch cases that the GPUs can exploit. So they suffer from low utilization and the training time and the training performance actually you know, degrades, a bit, you know, degrades largely. Right, but there has been these new, um, you know, training methods from like Facebook and GraphCore that show now actually competitive accuracy with small batch sizes, and this uh, arguably could be very suitable for FPGAs where GPU um, performance is pretty bad. So another thing is that you know training obviously has much more storage requirements um, compared to inference, and that's where some of these more recent you know, developments on HBM or high bandwidth memory like HBM2 uh, compared to conventional DDR3, DDR4 could be very handy in some of these new emerging workloads that really require a lot of memory and off-chip communication. So in the Stratix 10 um, MX with HBM2, they have eight independent, uh, eight independent channels and they basically doing a near memory with the DRAM system in package. They stack all these and provide a 128-bit wide I.O. and the peak memory bandwidth is very large as 20, 256 gig, giga BPS. Okay, so um, in terms of the, you know, first the training algorithm. So we first, um, you know, briefly went through that in the very beginning, but um, briefly going through a little bit more details is we have to go to the four paths and then we have to train each image with a label and the loss function estimates the network performance and provides an error values. And then in the backward pass, you know, these error values are propagated um, and very notably some flipped kernel or rotated kernel operation is necessary for the backprop convolution operations. And then reactivation, uh, you know, ReLU activation functions um, have to have these you know, gradient scaling uh, by the activation gradients. And then if we use the subsampling in the forward path, we have to do the opposite upsampling operation for like the max pooling. And for that, which means that we have to actually store the max pooling indexes that was, which pixels was selected and then go to the upsampling through that index, okay? And then finally, you know, as we went through the back propagation, we will get the Delta W and with the Delta W, calculation, we will need, we have the up, uh, information to update the weight gradients, right? So the convolution in, involved intratrial accumulations and new weights are computed at the end of the batch. And there are some other parameters involved in the learning such as learning rate, momentum, and so on. So in, you know, ResNet type of architectures, there's some more complication, especially with training because it involves like strat two, convolution, some, sometimes these are used instead of max pooling and there are these shortcut connections um, and these solve the vanishing gradient issues, but especially for training, they have to be um, taken care of accordingly. And there are many layers um, for the entire network. Um, and there are obviously some mobile net that has a large number of layers with different residual and strat of two architectures as well. So strut of two has to be taken care of, um, especially in the backward pass, the input image is dilated. So this needs some specific operations where we change the Mac control um, and during the weight update, you know, have to, you know, take care of the kernel dilation um, support accordingly, right? So these are some of the hardware um, changes that are specific for training. And then in terms of the hardware, um, we can have this, you know, starting from the HBM interface. So we start from storing all the parameters, initial parameters in the HBM to memory. And then we can have some of these um, data scatter, scatter gather modules that um, are custom designed to organize the HBM read and write data. And then the on-chip buffers and compute modules perform the you know, necessary forward, backward, and weight update 
and convolution operations. And then there's a global logic, obviously, that uh, monitors and governs the overall layer scheduling for the backward, forward, and weight update. The Mac array, um, this, you know, we can still use like a 2D, you know, Mac array that we, you know, previously used like an output stationary, for example, um, and these loop unrolling factor, similar, um, you know, philosophies can be used. Um, some different things to note is that, you know, compared to just only a forward pass, I mean, that's the only thing we use for inference, right? So that's what we did. In the inference case, we just do the input, convolve with the kernel and that results in the act, uh, activation. And this could be like 8-bit, 8-bit in here. And the kernel size are pretty small here, but in the back propagation and weight update, I mean, these local gradients are not three by three anymore, for example. So there's very size um, discrepancies and differences and all of these um, can be, has to be taken care of accordingly. Um, won't have time to go through all the details, but have to note some of these very distinct size differences and that can certainly impact how the you know, different uh, parts of the input weights and outputs have to be loaded and what kind of precision and um, structure is needed. And so dilated convolutions um, are stored, um, first the non-dilated version is stored and then you know, dilations we can do as we bring it into the FPGA and do it by the data scatter unit. And then the control, you know, performs dilations in the X dimension. And then the necessary control unit is available for both the weight side and the activation side. And um, this HVM configurator uh, obviously has to be newly set up compared to some more conventional DDR and DDR3, DDR4. So for, you know, the designers, you know, you might be dealing with some of these Intel and Xilinx FPGAs that have these HPM, you know, memory. And there are certainly IPs that are provided, but depending on how you want to, you know, store them, access them, you know, load them and convey them to the processing units, there could be um, some of these uh, custom configurators necessary on top of the provided IPs by Xilinx and Intel. And this is showing some examples of how, you know, these HPM2 read and write configuration signals are generated depending on some of these layers that we have to go through in the overall um, training process. Okay, and then the HPM um, in this Intel design example was integrated using the AMBA AXI4 protocol. So these are all standard protocols. Um, your design obviously has to be um, connected to those to provide a request and get the proper data, right? And connect them to the CNN, you know, inference or training accelerator here. Okay, so these are some of the specific channel allocations. This is not the only way to do it, but again, there are 16 channels and, you know, similar philosophy. If there are, you know, fixed hardware, we want to utilize them as much as possible, right? So this is one way of mapping all these six, I mean, utilizing these 16 channels to the utmost. So we, in the forward, in, in the inference, we would only have the forward pass or FP here. But again, in the training process, there are more things to think about. There's also this backward and weight update. Um, so we can think about ways of these weights, how they are, you know, mostly just using channel eight to 11 and activations and local gradients, different things that are needed in these three phases of training, at least to simplify that, okay, these are um, kind of contained in zero channel, the first eight channels. The next four channels are just dedicated to weights and then the weight gradients, obviously um, only there for the training side and don't really need it for the inference. But um, this is an important computation and also involve quite some bandwidth. So dedicating four channels here. Okay, So this is one way of optimizing the 16 independent channels and how we want to uh, communicate all the weights, activations and gradients uh, between the HVM and the FPGA accelerator. Okay, so some of the results of this training accelerator, um, this was using a more recent Intel Stripes 10 GXMX um, HBM2, um, and this was using 16 point floating point precision. So another thing about the precision is that inference, we all looked into, you know, 8-bit, 4-bit, 2-bit, binary, those are all fixed point precision, but for training, um, typically, all the state-of-the-art training workloads use floating point precision. The floating point precision numbers are going down, right, from 16-bit to 8-bit, 4-bit even, but 
they all use floating point, not necessarily fixed point. And the fixed point training, some works exist, but they don't really provide on par accuracy as the floating point training counterpart. So it's, for the training workload accelerator, it's important to flexibly support some of these floating point precision as well. Okay. So, um, so the Stratix 10, I mean, this is the GX, which is actually using a DDR3. And then you can see that um, some of the latency are heavily bounded by the memory here. And doing an apple to apple comparison with the you know, um, GX with HVM, you can see that like the 50, you know, more than half of the, you know, lot latency spend in the memory at the system level using the HVM can be brought down to, you know, 20 and 14%. And those are specific for these forward pass backward and weight update categorization, right? So you can see how HVM and high bandwidth memory can really accelerate these FPGA system much further, not only for, you know, inference, but much more for training as well. Um, and I talked about some of the GPU might be inefficient at smaller batch sizes. So this shows um, some of the more comprehensive comparisons. So let's say this is a CPU, this is a mobile GPU, this is a V100, more high, high, uh, high end GPU. And these are the GX FPGA with DDR3, and this is the MX FPGA with HPM. right? So you can see the total raw throughput value, obviously for high batch sizes, GPU is better. And then obviously with the high-end GPUs, it provides the highest performance in terms of gigaflops per watt for gigaflops for the ResNet 20. Now, if you look into the power, obviously like the CPU and the GPUs will consume much more power, like the mobile GPU has lower power, obviously. And you know, FPGAs will be closer to mobile GPUs, but consume more power than that. Right? And these have been you know, measured from the actual hardware or using some of these commands from the corresponding hardware platforms, right? So putting it together, if we look into, let's say the energy efficiency values as a function of the batch sizes, as I said, um, the like Tesla V100, you know, NVIDIA GPUs will have the highest gigaflops per watt energy efficiency at high batch sizes. And this could keep increasing for like, you know, 64, 128 batch sizes. Um, and you can see that uh, for the Stratix 10 GX is here and Stratix 10 MX is here, right? So for these relatively low batch sizes, again, some of the common ones use 128. So V100 could be higher, obviously, than FPGA over there. But for these lower batch sizes, it seems FPGA can have some unique advantages over GPUs due to this kind of utilization problem of the GPUs. And Encouragingly, these accuracies um, don't really degrade much as we go down to these small batch sizes, which also is beneficial from the hardware point of view, over general hardware point of view, not necessarily just only from the FPGA. Okay, so in summary, um, thank you for you know coming along with me for this long lecture. Um, I hope everybody is with me. It's hard to see without any faces and questions, not too much. But in summary, I went, you know, starting from some basics of the DNN algorithm, um, how the FPGAs have been involved to support some of these modern DNN algorithms and focus a lot on the DNN inference with different data flows, you know, how do we unroll stuff for parallelism, off-chip, on-chip memory access. And um, more recently, there has been, you know, pruning and low precision quantization from the algorithm side and also you know, exploiting some of these algorithm advances, new hardware designs have been presented. Um, and there are emerging workflows. DNN training is one. There are others like transformers, you know, um, different uh, types of neural networks and different continual learning. I mean, many, many algorithms are coming out at a very fast pace. Um, and those can be combined, you know, memory intensive things could be combined with like HPM hardware, recent FPGAs and more large scale FPGAs with more memory and computing resources. So I think one, you know, thing that I think my group has doing, I see a lot of group has been doing is, you know, for these DNN um, accelerators on FPGA, certainly FPGAs can have some unique advantages compared to GPUs and ASICs, um, as I mentioned. Um, but we all still have to keep a very close eye on what are the algorithm advances are because they are not just for the sake of algorithm, but they also come, come out with this new precisions, pruning, new workloads, and you know, efficiently implementing them on FPGAs could be certainly 
the new things that I can foresee. So that's uh, the end of the, my um, lecture. Thank you very much again for your kind attention. Then I'll happy to answer any questions. Okay, so I see a question in the chat. Um, so the question is, can we use systolic arrays for the hardware acceleration in spiking neural networks? Yes, a good question. So yeah, due to the limited kind of, um, you know, time still, I wasn't able to um, cover like new, a different type of workflow such as SNNs or spiking neural networks. Um, and there are some SNN, you know, FPGA papers, um, especially recently coming out and I believe also more developments will come out there. In principle, I believe, yes, the systolic arrays um, can be still used for spiking neural networks. There are different primitives that has to be there. And some of these time-based uh, operation and computation has to be taken care of. But at the end, still SNNs have many layers and each layer, there are many um, essentially spike-based math that has to happen. Um, and, um, you know, the spike at a given time can be binary, but the weights are still relatively, you know, sizable precision. I believe people are still using like four bit, eight bit, or some sometimes even larger, right? And some some people combine some of the spikes in the time domain to still multi bit value. So at, in, in in those approaches, it kind of resembles some of the systolic arrays with multi bit precision on both sides. But even you know, spike is binary. We can you know you know reuse some of those in a systolic array, whether that will be mapped onto DSPs or logic elements is, you know, will depend, but I believe the similar philosophy, there's definitely something to grab and be implemented to. Any other questions? Um, hi, uh, actually I have a question. Yeah. Uh, about uh, developing uh, DNN with uh, HLS tools, you know, uh, in high level synthesis tools, uh, it doesn't give you the opportunity to optimize the design in a register level. Like you say, uh, there are data used so we can use register to enhance the design more. So, uh, do you think uh, now the HLS can uh, design a good uh, DNN right now with this the technology right now? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it's, uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, these HLS and OpenCL are good in the sense that you can just write something at a very high level without um, necessarily knowing all the details about different logic elements, DSP, and so on and so forth. And you'll get a reasonable performance or sometimes high performance out of it. And, you know, these are, you know, these papers and more newer papers definitely report some advances there. And from each of these tools, every, you know, every year and every once in a while, there are new updates. And I believe compared to like five years ago, there has been a large improvement of how the mapping can be done and what kind of performance comes out. But as pointed out in the question, the key, one of the downside, key downside is that, let's say you use a synthesis and it does spit out a uh, synthesizable Verilog, but once you look at that Verilog, it's not something you can really modify. Um, it's all these, you know, things that are, you know, clogged in. It's really hard to understand that kind of Verilog. It's synthesizable. It's not something that you can really modify. So, you know, then you're kind of, you know, let's say you did it and you did this HLS and mapped it onto FPGA, something is suboptimal and you want to change it. At that point, you cannot really change something at the RTL or Verilog level. You still have to do these. Um, so I think, in that sense, some of I think that's one of the reasons why some other researchers have come to this other route where they have their own para parametrizable RTL as lower level modules, and there's more wiggle room that you can um, you can get all these done. And even after this is, you know, how do you customize it and change it for more you know optimal performance? There you can certainly do more stuff here. So 
I think, you know, those are kind of the trade-offs of these commercial vendor-based ones and some of the new research-based custom RTL generation. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. This was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for taking out time and doing this for us. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you. I hope uh, you enjoyed it too. Okay. I think